well, it's amazing to be here um, and discussing this topic, which I'm so excited for. This is the thing that I really, really enjoy talking about. So I am Kez Mayers. I go by she, her pronouns. I am a mental health a counselor associate in the state of Washington, as well as a sex therapist and a sex educator. And I have a private practice called Body and Bind Counseling. And through my work with my clients, especially when it comes to sex, we always talk about the components in which we'll talk about today. And I so, 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 so much love this topic. And so we'll talk about how to maintain your sexual autonomy. And so, oops. Let's see here. There we go. So I want you all to take a minute and think about when you grew up, what were some things that you were told about sex or you heard about sex? And feel free to put in the Q&A any comments, um, and I'll be sure to kind of read those as they come in. And so when I work with my clients, there are a lot of things that I hear quite often. And they're usually sexual myths, sexual norms that they grew up with that has shaped their understanding about how they relate to sex. And so some of the things that I hear, oh, ah, here we go. Cisgender women only want to have sex with cisgender men with long, thick penises. Cisgender men are always horny and cisgender women desire sex significantly less than men. For homosexual men, anal sex is the main way to have sex. For homosexual women, you can't have sex without a strap on. Um, oops, let me move this little chat here so I can see. Um, your sexual experiences should reflect those in pornography or porn is dirty and immoral. You can't get STDs from oral sex. Sex is defined as penis and vagina, or penis and anus intercourse and everything else is not foreplay or not considered to be sex. Um, trans and non-binary individuals don't have sex. Your sexual role is defined by your genitals and your gender. Missionary or vanilla sex is normal and everything else is abnormal or dirty. The general dichotomy of normal versus abnormal. Sex should look the same no matter what stage of life you're in. If I don't want sex or if I don't feel sexual attraction, there's something wrong with me. Sexual response is a linear progression, which must always end in orgasm. And lastly, masturbation is dirty. <laughs> and this is my, by no means an exhaustive list. There are so many other sexual myths and norms that I hear, but those are kind of the most common ones. And so when we look at the definition of myths, myths are stories that we create to conceptualize phenomenon. While a myth can be valuable, it's often a misrepresentation, an exaggeration, or a falsehood. All of those sexual myths were false. <laughs> There's so many sex researchers who have debunked these myths and have a different perspective. So when we engage with sex for myth rather than reality, we lose our sexual autonomy. And so this word, this term I've been saying, sexual autonomy, well, what is it? Let's define it. And so sexual autonomy is comprised of a few components. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the main points of sexual autonomy. So the first, it is the right to choose when and how to have sex, regardless of gender, sexuality, relationship structure, and spiritual or religious affiliation. to feel safe and in control of one's own body, the right to refuse sexual activity and to revoke consent during sexual activity, the right to privacy and access to sexual health care, and the right to receive competent and research-based sex education. Okay. And so how can I kind of gain some sexual autonomy in my life? Maybe ask it. And so the first thing that I kind of go through with my clients, with the people that I talk to, my friends, this is just the thing that I always talk about, is identifying your needs. 
This is so important. What do you want? What do you value, right? How significant is that need to you? When we look at needs, there's about four categories I kind of put them in. I put it in value-based needs, I put it in emotional needs, relationship needs, and sexual needs, and they kind of all tie into one another. So for value-based needs, this is based on your values, your values as an individual. So do you require honesty and integrity from self and from others? Right? Do you see compassion and empathy? in interpersonal relationships? Do you seek sensuality and connection with sexual and or romantic partners? Do you require acceptance and affirmation in your interpersonal relationships? Do you advocate for safety, security, and trust in all of your relationships? These are all values, right? We have emotional needs. The emotional need to receive affection. So that's non-sexual expressions of care. When we look at affection, we kind of think of the five love languages, right? Um, sexual fulfillment, the need to engage in pleasurable and consensual sexual experiences. Intimate conversation, the need to share feelings, experiences, topics of interests, opinions, goals. Recreational companionship, the need to engage in pleasurable recreational activities with other people. Honesty and openness, the need to be truthful and frank with others about positive and negative feelings and perspectives. Physical attractiveness, the need to observe someone who is aesthetically pleasing to you. And physical attractiveness is subjective. So what is physically and aesthetically pleasing to you may not be for the other person. So admiration, the need to be respected, valued, and appreciated in whatever relationship you're in. Then we have relationship needs, right? Do you have or want a stable and healthy relationship? Do you like your partner? Do you wanna have sex or do you feel like you should? Do you feel pressure to be in a relationship or to have sex? What kind of relationship are you looking for? What kind of relationship structure best suits your needs, whether that's monogamous, non-monogamous and all it entails and polyamorous? What are our attachment styles if I'm in a relationship with someone? How do we relate to each other based on our attachment styles? What if you don't feel safe in your relationship? How do we manage sexual health safety? Do we need birth control, STI testing, and other prophylactics? Can we get more specific in our sexual needs? Am I familiar with my body and how it works? Am I sexually attracted to others in general? What feels good or not good to me? What kinds of sexual activity do I like or not like? Whether this is traditional, vanilla, kinky, whatever it is. What, is, what excites me and what inhibits me during sexual activity? So when we think of um, the dual control model and excitation versus inhibition, so what makes you more aroused and what makes you less aroused? Is it difficult or easy for me to achieve orgasm? Do I need to experience an orgasm to have a fulfilling sexual experience? What increases or hinders my ability to be present during sexual activity? What does sex look like in my stage of life? So when you're a teenager versus a young adult versus when you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, as your body changes and you get older and you have more responsibilities, what does sex look like then? What arouses me about my partner? What is a fantasy versus a desire? And do I understand that normal sex is diversity? There is no one way that is normal, but rather our different ways of having sex is normal, right? And so how do your needs relate to sexual autonomy? So identifying your needs and your values allows you to understand what you want and be in control of what you want when engaging in sexual activity or navigating interpersonal relationships. So when we come back to the components of sexual autonomy, when we identify our needs, we kind of meet the first three, right? The right to choose when and how to have sex, the right to have sex in a way that feels affirming, pleasurable, safe, and consensual, and the right to feel safe and in control of one's own body. 
And so the next component of maintaining your sexual autonomy is setting boundaries. <laughs> and I know that with Alicia's presentation yesterday and um, with Izzy earlier, we touched on boundaries quite often. And so I want to go a little bit deeper. And so when I see my clients often, they're unable to really define what a boundary is and even to kind of differentiate it from a boundary versus a rule, right? And then what if other people don't respect their boundaries? Let's define what a boundary is. So a boundary are limits and rules that you set for yourself. As opposed to a rule, rules are limits set on others that they may or may not follow. And setting a boundary has the inherent value and in understanding that you can't control what other people do. You can only control what you do, right? And so how do you set boundaries? We're getting into the process of how we set a boundary. And there's usually three different ways, right? So the first one is a rigid boundary. And rigid boundaries are boundaries that are really, really hard to get through. There's no space for negotiation or flexibility, but usually some boundaries should be rigid depending on the setting and the person, but not all. For example, if you're at work, you wouldn't necessarily talk about your personal life and, and the details of it and share your feelings and your thoughts. You would want to be more professional, more uh, separated, but it also depends on what kind of work that you're in. So someone who operates from rigid boundaries constantly may not engage in close personal relationships. They may keep others at a distance, unlikely to ask for help and unable to meet other people's needs. Now we look at the other side of the spectrum, which is a porous or permeable boundary. And these are boundaries that are really, really easy to get through. So I know people will say, I don't have any boundaries. That's kind of false, like you do. You're an individual with your own needs and wants and limits, but you allow people to get through very easily. And so there's a common saying of like, you let people walk all over you. Some boundaries should be permeable depending on the setting and the person, but not all of your boundaries should be porous or permeable. So for example, like if you have a baby, <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily have healthy or rigid boundaries with them because you kind of operate on the baby's time, right? Um, someone who operates mainly with porous boundaries may find it hard to say no to other people. They may overshare their information. They fear rejection if they don't um, and be dependent on other people's opinions of them. And then we move right into the middle. Healthy and flexible boundaries are the middle ground of boundary setting. And so this is kind of your modus operandi, what you should be leaning to um, most often. So someone with flexible boundaries values their own opinions and experiences. They don't compromise their values. They know their wants and needs and communicates them assertively. And we'll talk about this more later. And they're able to say no to others and accepts no from others. And they're willing to compromise in certain areas. And so, what kinds of boundaries are there? So we talked about how you set them, the process of setting them. Now we kind of get to look at what kinds of boundaries can be set. And so there are about seven. And the first and very, very important is physical boundaries. And this relates to physical space, um, privacy, and bodily autonomy. So if someone touches you without your permission or consent, if someone goes through your phone without consent or goes into your room and picks through your things without your consent, those are violations of physical boundaries. And we have intellectual boundaries, which are kind of lesser known, but also very, very important. So intellectual boundaries refers to thoughts, ideas, and learning. And so if someone violates your intellectual boundaries, they stop you from being educated and learning about things, specifically sex, right? And also other things. Um, if they dismiss or belittle your ideas or steal your ideas, I think of artists and, and musicians and 
all that spectrum of if their ideas get stolen, that's a violation of an intellectual boundary. If someone wants to engage in a topic of conversation that's not comfortable for you and you've stated it and they continue to do it, that is a violation of your intellectual boundary. Emotional boundary, this pertains to needs, wants, and feelings. And so if someone violates your emotional boundaries, this looks like demeaning or belittling you, gaslighting you, saying that you're crazy, you're not feeling this thing, um, or they kind of ignore you. And those are violations of your emotional boundaries. Sexual boundaries also very, 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 very important. And sexual boundaries kinds of, it takes um, from the first three of physical, intellectual, and emotional boundaries, because sex kind of encompasses all three. And so people who violate your sexual boundaries, they engage in sexual activity with you without your consent. They touch you without your consent. They will like gaze and leer at you without your consent. And so those are really important to have. Material boundaries. This refers to possessions and money. So if someone steals something without um, letting you know that they want to take that, they take it without your permission, um, they ask for too much of your things or pressure you to give them your things or your money, those are violations of material boundaries. Time boundaries. So time Boundaries refer to having a set amount of time dedicated to each area of your life. So your personal relationships, your work, your hobbies. And you can also violate your own time boundaries by putting too much time in one area. Or someone else can violate your time boundaries by asking too much of your time or pressuring you to give them too much of your time. Spiritual boundaries, this is also a lesser known one, but it's also very important and it works in several different ways. So it refers to um, your values, your practices and your beliefs, um, whether spiritual or religious based. And so someone can violate your spiritual boundaries if they require you to practice and believe the same things that they do. Or someone who who has certain beliefs and practices, their boundaries can be violated if someone tries to tell them not to practice those things or try to convince them to do other things that don't align with their values and beliefs. And so some notes about boundaries. Um, I could talk about boundaries all day, but I know we're limited by the time that we have. So I wanna keep it quite short and give um, the very basic information about them. And so some things to consider is that most people have a mix of boundary types. So for example, one could have healthy or rigid boundaries at work, porous boundaries in romantic or sexual relationships, and a mix of all three with family. So you never usually lean into one over the other, but you could have a mix. Determining which boundary is appropriate depends on the setting. So like for the first point, what boundary you set for work versus your relationships versus um, your personal life, those will look a little bit different. And especially when it comes to sexual trauma, if you are assaulted or abused or raped, usually you go right into the rigid boundary. And that's usually to establish a sense of safety. I need to keep myself safe. So I'm putting a wall up in every area of my life. Some cultures have different expectations when it comes to setting boundaries. So in some cultures, rigid boundaries are healthy and in other cultures, porous boundaries are healthy. And this also depends within that on gender roles and economic class or caste systems. So people, <laughs> may violate your boundaries or refuse to even acknowledge them. This is very, very common. And they may also engage in what we call an extinction burst in behavior um, in behaviorism, which means that their negative behaviors will increase or they will push back harder at you when reinforcement is removed. And in this case, the reinforcement is when you shift 
from a porous boundary to a healthy boundary or a rigid boundary if appropriate. And so it can be very, very uncomfortable and anxiety inducing to set boundaries with others. And even yourself, it's hard to set boundaries with yourself. And so I saw this little graph on Instagram when I was scrolling and I thought it was so, so appropriate for this conversation of the difficulty of setting a boundary. And so the actual difficulty goes from realizing that you need a boundary, setting the boundary, reinforcing the boundary and reminding myself and others about my boundary. But the predicted is that you get to setting the boundary and then you kind of like didn't think that far of reinforcing it and reminding yourself and others to set that boundary. And so that's usually what it looks like. And so how do boundaries relate to sexual autonomy? Almost all aspects of boundary setting relates to one's sexual autonomy. So violations of physical, emotional, intellectual, sexual, and spiritual boundaries violates one's sexual autonomy. When we come back to the criteria, let's see which conditions we need. The right to choose when and how to have sex, the right to have sex in a way that feels affirming, pleasurable, safe, and consensual, the right to feel safe and in control of one's own body, the right to refuse sexual activity and revoke consent, the right to privacy and access to sexual health care, um, because this leans into physical and intellectual boundaries, and the right to receive competent and research-based sex education, which leads into um, intellectual boundaries, right? And so all conditions are met here. Uh, so I've identified my needs and boundaries. Now what? What do I do? We communicate that. <laughs> and we've already stated like setting boundaries are hard and it's even harder to communicate that with other people. And so am I fearing potential conflict when I set a boundary or state my needs? What kind of communicator am I? And how do I advocate for what I need, right? So let's look into the types of communicators that there are. So there's three different kinds. We have passive, aggressive, and assertive. And so a passive communicator prioritizes the needs, wants, and feelings of others at their own expense. Their own needs and wants don't matter. Other people's do. They allow other people to take advantage of them. They kind of have porous and permeable boundaries. So that kind of goes hand in hand, passive communicator, porous and permeable boundaries. They're soft spoken, lacking confidence in their voice. And this is different from just generally and naturally being a soft speaker, but rather they're kind of scared to say what they want and be confident in that. Right? An aggressive communicator, only their needs, wants, and feelings matter. They got easily frustrated and unwilling to compromise. They have rigid boundaries, right? Aggressive communicator, rigid boundary setting. Use of criticism, humiliation, gaslighting, and intense body language to assert dominance. They frequently interrupt. They don't listen, right? Ooh, let me move. This uh, ignores or speaks in a loud or overbearing way. So the middle ground, like the middle ground of a healthy, flexible boundary setter is an assertive communicator. So an assertive communicator understands the importance of their own needs and the needs of others. They're willing to compromise and problem solve. They have healthy and flexible boundaries. They have a confident tone and body language and they also respect other people's physical boundaries. This is as opposed to an aggressive communicator who wants to get into your personal space and assert dominance. An assertive communicator listens without interruption and clearly states their wants, needs, and feelings. Because they matter too. And so when we look at healthy communication, what does it consist of? What is it? And so healthy communication consists of a few components. And the first that we've just talked about is assertive communication right? Confident tone, body language, willing to compromise, very flexible, 
willing to say no and accept no. Great. Then we have I statements. Often I will hear, oh my God, my therapist wants me to use I statements. I'll never use this. This is so weird. I can't talk that way. But it's actually very, very, very effective. Because when we take responsibility for what we want and need and what we feel and what we think, this gives us ownership of that and confidence in that rather than blaming other people. Because again, when we go back to the definition of a boundary, that's like, you can't control what other people do. You can only control what you do. And so no one can make you do anything. But the situation can lead to some feelings that come up. And so saying, I feel blank when this happens or when you say this or when you do this, I feel that and I want blank, right? Using I statements, making the responsibility on you. What do you want? What do you feel? What do you need, right? Mirroring validation and empathy. So these are components of a MAGO dialogue, which we also don't have time to go deep into, but this is a perfect um, way to communicate. And mirroring consists of kind of repeating back what you heard, right? To make sure that you're understanding and you want to understand what the other person is trying to say. So I heard you say this, is that right? That's mirroring. Or if you want to ask clarifying questions, if you didn't hear them right, that's a great opportunity to do that. Can you tell me more about this? I didn't quite understand what you meant by that. Or can you say this in, the, in another way? Validation. So validation is letting the other person know that you understand their perspective. This doesn't mean that you agree with that perspective, but rather you understand it given how humans work <laughs> and what they feel in what situations and how you understand that other person to work. So I understand why you would get really angry if I did this, right? And that also leads into empathy, really picking up the emotional experience of what this person is trying to say, right? I hear that you feel angry, right? And then we get in to the process of reflective communication, of kind of analyzing where the problem in your communication is. And that's usually in four levels. So what you mean to say, what you actually say, what the other person hears and what the other person thinks you mean. And usually when you get into communication issues, it's one of those four components. Yeah. All right, how do we communicate assertively? First, you have to respect your own needs, values, and perspectives, as well as those of the person that you're communicating with. You can plan or practice what you want to say if you are unable to communicate in that moment. Take some time to think about it. That's okay to do. Have good eye contact when appropriate, right? A steady voice and a confident body language. Stick to one topic at a time. Sometimes people get into garbage canning or kitchen sinking, in which they'll bring in a bunch of things when they're feeling really activated, when you only have one particular problem. So sticking to one topic at a time keeps the conflict out. Clearly state your wants, your needs, and your boundaries to that person. Express your thoughts and feelings calmly, even if they get activated. You can control what you do, right? Listen without interruption, mirror or ask for clarity. Say no when you need to. Izzy just talked about this. It's okay to say no when you need to. And also be willing to compromise. So if you need to say no, say no. But if you feel like you can compromise, please do. And so how does healthy communication relate to sexual autonomy? Healthy communication allows the individual to express their needs and boundaries to others in an assertive way. Healthy communication fosters connection with other people, establishes safety, and increases in self-confidence. 
I can state my needs. I can state my boundaries and follow through with them. Maintaining your sexual autonomy, getting to the meat of what we're here about. Let's define maintenance. Maintenance is that process, that practice of keeping something in good condition and of good functioning, right? And that's through practice, through tune-ups, through reflection and awareness, what's going on, right? So continuously communicating your needs and boundaries. It's how you maintain your sexual autonomy. If you don't want to do something, say, I don't want to do this, right? This, this is what I want. Can we do this, right? Continuously reflect on your needs and boundaries as they change over time. As you get older, as you experience new things and you're put in different situations, you learn, you change, you grow. How do your needs and boundaries change with that? You don't need to defend or justify your boundaries to anyone. But if the person is willing to engage, you can choose to explain why you have that boundary. Be patient with yourself. Sometimes you'll express your needs and follow through on boundaries, and sometimes you won't. That's part of being human, is not being perfect all the time. Instead of telling yourself, I failed, or I'm a failure, or I didn't do this right, engage with, how can I improve next time? We're so hard on ourselves. We've got to be gentler with ourselves. Advocate for yourself in all applicable spaces. So work, specifically sex work, healthcare providers, right? And voting now, because we kind of have to be more aware of reproductive health policy with the overturn of Roe versus Wade, in America at least. Take care of yourself. Perfection does not exist, right? I've got some resources that I can come back to. Kev, do you want to tell everybody a little bit more about what you do as, speci as specialities? Just because obviously it's you've done quite a bit already. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, mainly you are beautiful and educated. I love it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm definitely, my specialty is sex therapy, but I work very much with um, the kink and BDSM community, as well as those who are in um, alternative relationships. So I see a lot of different non-monogamous relationships. Um, I see a lot of poly relationships and I can kind of help them navigate that. And so coming, um, engaging in negotiation, setting contracts, um, relationship agreements. And I also work with, and a lot of counselors will say like, I will not work with these people, but I do work with couples who have um, engaged in infidelity. And that's also right. very, very fun <laughs> to, to do. Um, it's such fulfilling work. It's never easy, but it's, it's definitely Definitely this fun. is why I wanted to get you to say because I read up a bit more on your profile and I was like right there's there's a lot to be said about doing presentations but actually knowing how to base them around sort of certain areas is also, also great and obviously with you with your background you're much more affiliated with the sex workers as well it's just like yeah it's a very good promotional tool to have <laughs> <laughs> absolutely I, does anyone, did you have any more, any, anything that you wanted to present or should we, because I've got a couple of questions if you wanted. Yes, please <laughs> ask questions. Um, um, always, always, always great for a bit of free advice, you know, if no one else is going to come forward. So when, if, if you're in a situation and someone is not respecting your boundaries, um, obviously, the way that I am is I'm, I can be quite fiery, so I don't handle those situations very well. Um, I am like a quite aggressive, <laughs> should we say, in some <laughs> respects. Yeah. And I like, I've tried to do the deep breathing aspects, but when you're in the heat at the moment, that doesn't always uh, do very well. But if we want, if you, is there, are there any sort of ways that you can describe to people to make, try and like regroup and like stop themselves like, 
overstepping those boundaries because it's so easy to do is once someone else goes beyond their boundaries suddenly mm -hmm. your boundaries get blurred and you're like right well now i now i need to absolutely face up. <laughs> there's so many answers to this question and none of them are perfect no um, no far away it's better than, better than a lot of knowledge than none <laughs> yeah so it depends on the person that you're setting the boundary with so setting a boundary with someone who's a friend versus a romantic or sexual partner versus a family member, those are drastically different in how you would respond to a boundary violation. So I get people coming into the office with a lot of boundary violations from family. Mm -hmm. And usually it's kind of like setting a new boundary. So you have repeatedly violated my boundaries. And if you continue to do that, I will distance myself from our relationship, right? Or I will kind of like choose to ignore the things that you say that are disrespectful and not really pay attention to them um, or kind of cut off contact. And that's like usually in the very drastic end, some people can do that and some people can't. And so limiting contact works for them. When it's um, a romantic partner or a friend, um, having a limit for yourself how much do you want to reinforce that boundary or remind that person of that boundary before that is no longer a person that you want to associate with if they continue to violate your boundaries? Okay. It's so difficult though, isn't it? Because you just, it's okay. like, it's, and it's so difficult, but like just the baby steps, doing it a little, little bit and often, trying mm -hmm. to build yourself up because- yeah. I know that I've, I've seen cases before where, you know, people try so hard and put so much effort on themselves in one instance, like I've got to be perfect straight away. You know, boundaries are massive. <laughs> they're a massive thing and they're constantly changing. So you don't know, you know, you might, and it's the same with sexual partners. If you make a contract and, and you agree one thing mm -hmm. with one day, it yeah. might be that actually, you know, I want to negotiate that a bit another day or, you know, well, things may need to be adapted, but it's it's about the constant communication um, yes. going forward. Yes. But no, it's um, it, I find it so interesting because you know everybody everybody's completely different, so no mm -hmm. two people are going to be wanting the same out of any relationship or any situation, right. and especially when you throw into in, into effect like studios and then directors and casting <laughs> people. You know, yes. it's like. And yeah. like, that's the whole point of bringing like these resources together with pineapple support and doing these mm -hmm. webinars to show people that there are lots of different varieties of different ways to cope and maintain and re reaffirm with yourself what you want from your life and, and the future. So no, it, it's wonderful to have you on board and to, to hear to put your presentation forward. It seems that we've got a quiet audience today. So <laughs> it looks like your questions and our questions are going to be sl slim and far between. But there also obviously is, you've got the details so you can get in touch with Kes Direct if you do want to contact her. And I, like I say, you can always contact us through Pineapple Support. I thank yes. you so much for your time today. And then um, I will let you. <laughs>